John? John? John. Okay, I think we'll get started. I know we still have some people eating downstairs, but I've sent the troops down to hustle them up. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, kickoff of this year's Distinguished Public Lecture Series sponsored by the Virginia Tech Carilion Research Institute. And this is a special evening in many occasions, not only, of course, an outstanding speaker to launch the series, but a newly named program. And I want to say a little bit about that as we get started. Uh, so I think perhaps many of you have read about this program that is now named the VTCRI Mari Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture Series. And that is based on an extremely generous gift, a donation from Mr. Strauss of a million dollars to this program to endow the program going forward. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to say a little bit about uh, Mr. Strauss. Um, not only is he uh, a dear friend, uh, obviously of ours and supporter and uh, well-loved member of the community. As many of you know, he's been a community benefactor here for many years in Roanoke. Uh, he is the founder of Strauss Development Corporation, real estate development firm. Uh, he and his uh, wife Sheila, a couple years ago, made a major gift of land, donating the Garce Mill Park property that is so much beloved by this city and used in so many ways by many people. Uh, in addition, he has served in numerous capacities as president of the Mill Mountain Theater uh, and on that board for Mill Mountain Theater. Uh, he served also uh, on the board of the Virginia Western Community College and been involved in a number of other areas, including being president of the Roanoke and the Virginia Statewide Home Builders Association. Uh, he did graduate from the University of Virginia, and we forgive him for that, and it's okay. Uh, but he is a Roanoker <clears throat> uh, through and through, and I think his support for this uh, program is extremely indicative of that. Uh, before I <clears throat> introduce uh, Maurice Strauss to you, I also want to mention that we are very honored this evening to have a number of members of the Strauss family here with us. Uh, we have Steve Strauss, Maury's son, uh, sitting next to him, and we have Lori Strauss, Steve's wife, uh, and Andy, uh, their grandson, and Leslie, uh, 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 Maury's daughter. Um, we also have a number of friends of Maury Strauss in the front rows, and I'm not going to go through all the names, but I would like to, for a moment, ask Maury if he would please stand and be honored and recognized by everybody here for this great gift he's given the community. And it's just another example of the giving back to the community, and, and we obviously appreciate it very much, and I know everybody in this room does as well, and a lot of people that are probably online watching the live feed of the video stream. Thanks so much, Maury. It's a pleasure and honor uh, to be your colleague and your friend. Thank you so much for all you've done. Uh, before I get on to introducing our guest, I just want to mention as a little ad, the next uh, lecture in this series, in the Distinguished Public Lecture Series, will be November 15th. You can check it on our website, of course. It'll be Dr. Peter Rosenbaum, the founder of the Can Child Center for Childhood Disability Research and the Canada Research Chair in Childhood Disabilities at McMaster University. So please check out the VTCR website and all the subsequent speakers as well. It's going to be a terrific program, I guarantee you. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Tony Rosenzweig from uh, Harvard and Mass General. Dr. Rosenzweig is the Paul Dudley White Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is also a professor of biological and biomedical sciences at Harvard, serves as chief of the cardiology division at Mass General Hospital, director of cardiovascular research there as well, and also co-directs the Corrigan Mind and Heart Center uh, at Mass General. Um, Dr. Rosenzweig did his undergraduate work at Harvard. He took his medical degree at Harvard Medical School. He went on to serve as a fellow at Harvard. Uh, 
He did multiple uh, research fellowships in cardiology and genetics and vascular biology at the Brigham and William, uh, the Brigham and Women, sorry, uh, and at Harvard. Uh, and then he was invited to join the faculty of his alma mater at Harvard, initially as an assistant professor, then an associate, and of course, a full professor. He has received numerous accolades and recognition by his peers for his multiple and very important contributions to our understanding of cardiovascular function, both in health and in disease. Uh, he has served as the associate editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, as a trustee of the Harvard Clinical Research Institute, uh, served recently as an NIH member of the uh, study section, that's the review panel for grants on the myocardial, myocardial ischemia study section. He's an established investigator of the American Heart Association, uh, and he's received the Stephen Crane Award for Excellence in Medical Research. He is truly a world-recognized leader in heart failure research and understanding and developing novel therapeutic targets, as well as leading to an understanding of the basic biological mechanisms that underlie heart function. And I can say, if you look through uh, his CV and read his papers and look at his entire history, what permeates the entire career, in my opinion, is not only working towards <clears throat> the end goal of understanding how to better improve health and treat heart disease, but always working to understand the fundamental science and underlying, underlying biology. He truly is a classic physician scientist who comes at it as a scientist, but also as a physician. Uh, he has identified the role of uh, exercise in heart health. I think we'll hear about that tonight. Uh, he's identified abnormal calcium handling as central to heart failure, a very important discovery for the pathogenesis of heart disease that has led to phase two and three clinical trials uh, targeting the circa gene uh, through a genetic therapy treatment for heart failure. He's identified signaling pathways in cardiomyocytes survival and function, including new targets for treating heart failure and arrhythmia. And he has also identified differences in heart growth from exercise versus from pressure overload, a very, very different situation in understanding the differences of how the heart responds in that regard is extremely important. And this has led to studies of cardioprotective and regenerative effects of exercise on the heart. And finally, it would be remiss for me to not say that clearly he is dedicated to training the next generations of scientists and physicians and is extremely heavily involved from board foundation positions to running the training program uh, at Mass General in uh, cardiovascular health and disease training. He has, he has trained over 50 or so uh, researchers himself uh, in his own laboratory, and he's absolutely committed to the future generations of biomedical scientists and physicians. So please join me in welcoming tonight's uh, speaker in the Maury Strauss Lecture, Dr. Tony Rosenzweig. Wow. Well, thank you for that overly generous introduction. I think I better sit down now because it's going to be hard to live up to that. But um, if you wouldn't mind repeating that for my wife, um, uh, that would be great. She, she has a slightly different perspective on my contributions. Uh, I, I'm truly deeply honored to be here, and thank you all for coming. And, and I um, particularly appreciate Mr. Strauss and the Strauss family's support of this uh, series, which I've only learned about and, and I think is such a wonderful idea to have the interaction between uh, healthcare researchers and professionals and, and the lay public so they can really open up the channels of communication. Um, so um, as you heard, we've mostly studied heart failure and, and a few years ago sort of had the shockingly slow epiphany that we understand much more about what goes wrong in disease than what keeps the heart healthy. Um, and often understanding what goes wrong in disease doesn't tell you how to fix it. So you can know why a car is broken, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have the part you need to, to replace. And so um, in that vein, began to say, well, could we understand what keeps the heart healthy and maybe use the exercised heart as a model of heart health that would teach us something different? And um, I would say over the last five to 10 years, we've focused increasing energy on this, and, and um, I'll, I'll share some of that work with you um, today. So uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I have done some consulting about uh, disease. Um, the only one that's relevant here is something that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, uh, which is a pathway that grew out of exercise studies that um, uh, Mass General and Beth Israel Deaconess have filed a patent for that we're co-inventors on. Um, but we've, none of this work has been supported by um, industry, and uh, much as I've tried to patent exercise, it, it hasn't worked. So, <laughs> um, I did want to start with um, some comments about 
uh, heart disease in general. Because I've got to say, when I, when I speak sometimes to the lay public, one of the comments that I get is, well, haven't we figured that out? Don't we know that you know, if you just eat right and exercise, it's all taken care of? But haven't we cured that already? And in fact, there's been enormous progress in the treatment and prevention of cardiovascular disease. And this is an image that was taken from a New England Journal of Medicine paper that Eugene Brownwald and Betsy Nabel at the Brigham wrote, which basically shows a timeline over the past you know, 50 or 60 years and the decline in cardiovascular uh, deaths over this period. And what they have put on this timeline are are various scientific and clinical advances that they're suggesting contributed to that reduction um, in cardiovascular death. So there really has been enormous progress. And if you come into the hospital with a heart attack now, your chance of dying with that heart attack is about 80% less than it was 50 years ago. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, on the other hand, uh, this figure shows the burden just measured in dollars, which is probably, I, I would submit, only one and, and, and probably in some ways the least important metric of, of the burden of cardiovascular disease. But the burden of cardiovascular disease now and over the coming decades, I know this is hard to see, but out here at 2030, the estimate is that the total cost to in America will be something on the order of $800 billion. And again, that's just an indicator of the burden of disease, the real burden, is the human burden in suffering and, and morbidity. So how do we reconcile these two images of cardiovascular disease? On one hand, we're telling you we've made enormous progress. On the other hand, you see that in some sense, the amount of time, energy, and resources that we're spending dealing with cardiovascular disease is actually increasing somewhat paradoxically. And I really think there are three principal drivers of this. The first is, in some sense, it's the burden of our success. So we've gotten really good at getting people through that heart attack when they come into the emergency room. We're very good at knowing that the first thing we have to do is get them to the cath lab and open that artery, and virtually every hospital in the country does that within an hour and a half now. Um, so your odds of surviving are greater, but then of the people who survive, a significant number go on and develop the late sequelae, the adverse consequences, things like heart failure, rhythm problems with the heart that come because of the scar that may have formed during that heart attack. So in some sense, our success has turned cardiovascular disease from an acute illness where we lost a lot of people decades ago to a chronic illness where we're a little bit less prepared for knowing how to impact that. Um, the second thing is that we are in this country in an epidemic of cardiometabolic disease, and we'll talk a little more about that, but things like diabetes and obesity um, have a huge impact on cardiovascular disease, both through increasing the number of heart attacks, but actually also through direct effects on heart muscle. And then the third thing, which is kind of obvious, um, and often we don't even mention, but it's just that our populations are aging. So as people age, the number of people um, who are at risk for uh, cardiovascular disease, in particular heart failure and arrhythmia, rises quite uh, substantially. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. So, so um, I was going to say a little bit more about the cardiometabolic disease. So, you know, we obviously evolved in a very different circumstance. And, and so uh, our ancestors lived in a resource-poor environment where calories were hard to come by and where the bigger threats were things like saber-toothed tigers that you had to run from. Um, and um, now uh, we're actually confronted with different threats. Um, and we're constantly being supersized. And, and this has resulted in... <laughs> Um, us becoming supersized, um, and, and again, that increases risk of a whole host of diseases, but including cardiovascular uh, disease. Um, and then uh, in concert with that, we've also become more sedentary. So we've moved from uh, you know, being physically active and even laboring in ways that are physically active to many of us sitting hunched over a computer uh, much of the day. Um, and and um, as I'll try to convince you, that sedentary lifestyle also carries with it um, a cost um, and risk. So um, this, of course, is uh, Michelangelo's David. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> stepped on my own punchline there. But uh, some people have said if he were alive today, this is what David, <laughs> David would look like. Um, and he would be at much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, the longevity is an interesting thing. So this was kind of interesting to me in that, you know, 120 years ago or so, um, the life expectancy was really only around 50. And, and it's really pretty dramatically improved, right, um, since then. 
Um, and so as people live longer, we're at risk for a host of um, uh, chronic diseases, including heart failure and arrhythmia, which are particularly tightly linked to aging. Um, I'd be remiss in my uh, public health uh, role if I didn't point out, what's, what's this? Does anybody know? So that's the uh, 1918 influenza epidemic, so exactly. So if you haven't already gotten your flu vaccine, um, <laughs> this is an unpaid public service announcement to, to go ahead and do so. But um, in that context, this was a, an editorial written by Maggie Redfield in the New England Journal, just pointing out the number of people in millions over the age of 65 in the United States is anticipated to skyrocket. And so the population of people with these chronic diseases, in particular heart failure, um, is anticipated to increase. So if we don't figure out new ways to treat this, we're going to be in, in trouble. So I've mentioned this word a couple of times, but you know, what is heart failure? Um, so heart failure is, in broad strokes, an inability of the heart, technically at normal pressure levels, filling pressures in the heart to meet the demands of the, of the body. And it's manifested often by shortness of breath and swelling in the legs or sometimes the abdomen um, because fluid builds up in those organs. And it affects more than 6.5 million people in the United States. For many years now, it's been the single most common discharge diagnosis in the Medicare population. That's people over the age of 65. So of all those people going home from the hospital, this has ranked uh, number one. Um, and I think importantly, uh, for many years as well, um, the prognosis for many subsets of patients with heart failure uh, has remained poor. So this is an old paper from about a dozen years ago. So the, the good news is that the survival rates have improved. Um, the bad news is they haven't improved that much. And so this was looking at how did people do at the Mayo Clinic after they came into the hospital with their first hospitalization for heart failure? And heart failure falls into two categories where either the heart is not pumping vigorously enough, what we call heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, meaning the fraction of blood being pumped out um, is, is below normal, so that's this group in the black line, or patients where the pumping function is okay, but there are other things, in some cases the heart doesn't relax normally, that also can create a syndrome that looks exactly like and is, is heart failure. Um, and I think the surprise when this paper came out was that in both of these groups, I think many of us as clinicians thought that the people where your ejection fraction was okay actually did okay, but in both of those groups back in 2006, you can see that the five-year survival was below 40%. It's gotten better. It's probably more like 50 or slightly above 50% um, after an index hospitalization. But still, that's obviously on the order of bad malignancies. And so you know, for, for um, cardiology, in a sense, this is our cancer. Um, and, and so again, we've converted a lot of people whose acute hypertensive crisis or heart attack um, we originally didn't know how to deal with. We now can deal with that, but they go on and develop these syndromes that we've been less effective at dealing with. We do have some drugs, just to hasten to add, um, for the group of people who have weakened heart muscle that do improve outcomes and make people live longer and require less hospitalization. There are about five drugs that, uh, that do that. Um, so far, no drugs have managed to do that for people who where the pumping function is preserved, but they still have heart failure. So we have a lot to do, and that's about half of the heart failure that we see. So with that sort of clinical introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about what the way at least we're thinking about um, understanding heart failure and trying to therefore use that understanding to generate new targets. And so again, as I mentioned a while back, we sort of had this epiphany that heart failure often develops after a period of abnormal growth of the heart. And that growth can be in response to a heart attack or in response to high blood pressure or a valve problem. And that's shown here. And we call that, we like to use fancy words, we call that pathologic hypertrophy, just meaning it's a disease state. And the blue is meant to depict uh, scarring in the heart muscle. So the heart muscle, um, compared to normal, the heart enlarges, the heart muscle thickens, and it gets this scar, um, and then sometimes goes on and dilates and becomes weakened. And so people in both of these conditions are at risk for heart failure. This is probably more likely to be heart failure with a normal ejection fraction, so the pumping function is okay, and this would be with reduced ejection fraction. And both of these populations are at risk for both uh, clinical problems because of heart failure, but also rhythm problems with the heart, both rhythm problems that start in the top of the heart, like atrial fibrillation, and, and those that start in the bottom that can be life-threatening, like ventricular arrhythmias. But the heart also grows in response to other stimuli, more physiologic or normal stimuli, like exercise. And typically, 
that does not lead to, with possibly some exceptions at the true extremes of exercise, that doesn't lead to these adverse uh, consequences. Um, so we thought that that was, that was an interesting contrast. And so this is a picture of Michael Phelps, um, who won more gold medals in swimming than any other Olympic athlete. And I should say, I'm, this is not an ethical violation. I don't know anything about Michael Phelps' actual medical history. I haven't taken care of him. But most endurance athletes have enormous hearts. And we would expect that he would have a very large heart, but would not be at risk um, for these other um, conditions. So why is it? Why is it that one part of kind of growth leads to these adverse consequences and the other doesn't? Um, I, I should say that I used to have a picture of Lance Armstrong here <laughs> and realized there were some confounders um, associated with Lance's behavior that maybe um, uh, might uh, uh, make it difficult to conclude anything. But, but um, I think that does point out one of the difficulties of studying things like exercise in humans because um, people very much self-select what kind of lifestyle choices we make. And so there may be something fundamentally different about somebody who decides to become and has the capacity to become an Olympic athlete, but even somebody who trains or exercises to that extent and somebody who doesn't. Um, and so I think this is um, a situation where um, studying uh, animal models can be particularly helpful in terms of elucidating those things. But in any case, we thought that if we could understand the difference between why one kind of growth um, uh, doesn't lead to these bad things and the other does, that might be interesting. And I should say that not only doesn't, not only is it true that exercise doesn't lead to these bad things, it actually seems to protect the heart. So uh, both people who exercise, um, either before or after a heart attack, have better outcomes. But also in animal models where you can really study these things, it's very clear that animals with exercise, if you then tie off one of the coronary arteries and cause a heart attack artificially, they'll have less heart damage, they'll recover more quickly, their heart function will be improved. So not only doesn't it lead to bad things, but it actually seems to be protective. So, so, so why is that? You know, um, and we thought this might be an interesting um, contrast. And so when we started this a few years ago, I think we had a few basic questions about how the physiologic and the pathologic growth of the heart um, were different. And, and so some of the obvious questions we had is, you know, are they truly different in a qualitative, fundamental way, or is it just a quantitative difference? Because even if you're Michael Phelps, you swim six hours a day, but you rest 18 hours a day. Whereas if you have aortic stenosis or hypertension, it's generally present 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So maybe it's just a question of degree. Maybe these things aren't really uh, uh, as different as, as we were supposing. And it's just that when, you, when the dose exceeds a certain level, you run into these problems. And the second thing is we know that exercise does lots of important and beneficial things systemically. So it changes your skeletal muscles, it changes your vasculature, it changes your metabolism. All of that is an important part of the benefits of exercise. What we really, really wondered was, are there also things intrinsic to the heart that are changed by exercise? Um, and, and could we identify what those are and do they contribute to its benefits? And if so, could we figure out a way to use those, that insight, those pathways to come up with new treatments? So, so with those, tre with those questions, I, I think many of you are probably aware there are lots of ways to catalog all of the differences between two different states. So basically, we have two states. We have the exercised heart, and then we have the pathologically grown heart that we can induce in an animal just by constricting the aorta um, or animals with hypertension and so on. And so, so there are lots of techniques where you can take those tissues um, and, and identify this starry night image here is actually all of the genes that are expressed in the genome, and you can actually analyze those. This is a chip that's actually about the size of your thumb, and on that chip the size of your thumb, you can analyze every one of the 20 or 30,000 genes in the genome and understand how they change and sort of get a map, this is called a heat map, of what goes up or what goes down um, in those uh, different conditions. So all you need to do an experiment like this is actually cardiac uh, tissue. Um, and so, you know, multiple call, calls to Michael Phelps went unanswered. He was shockingly uninterested in helping our studies. It, we just needed a small bit of his heart. But um, so we turned to a different group of elite athletes shown here. Um, they don't actually get little floaties, but Nina Mann, who was a medical student working in the lab, actually found this uh, picture and thought it was cute. But we do swim them in sort of a Michael Phelps-esque pool. This is a very high-tech pool that we got from Target for about $4.95. 
um, and it basically uh, is just a tub. You do have to watch the temperature so that they're, uh, uh, you know, the temperature is at their body temperature. And mice are not natural swimmers, I would say, so you have to train them and you have to have a good lifeguard. So Nina was a good lifeguard, and so we start them out 10 minutes twice a day, and then we escalate each day by 10 minutes in each session, so that by the end of two weeks, they're doing about 90 minutes twice a day, so about three hours of swimming a, a day. So the first thing to say is this is not going for a walk, you know, sort of a couple of times a week. This is pretty intense. You'll see some of them are smarter than the others, and they will, or lazier, and they'll cling to the thermometer here and not actually exercise. Those are not the ones we're interested in. Um, uh, and, and then some of them are, are, you know, can't swim, and you'll see Nina will rescue one in a, in a, in a moment. And, and so again, if you don't have a good lifeguard, the swimming model turns into a drowning model, which is you know, a separate question, which could be interesting in its own right, but again, not, not what we're interested in. So then we collected mice and, and sort of tried to understand what was going on in the hearts of mice after they swam, and have compared that to, again, a, a surgical model where we can constrict the aorta uh, uh, somewhat analogous to if somebody has an, a, a narrowed aortic valve, so they have aortic stenosis, and this model we know ultimately develops uh, pathologic hypertrophy, scarring of the heart muscle, and even heart failure. But we looked at really early stages when the hearts look identical, so they've both grown to the same extent, and you don't have scarring yet, or cell death, or a bunch of these things. I should say that this model does get criticized because it's a little stressful for the animals, so you do train them, and you try to mitigate that. But we've also looked um, at, at running uh, models. So, so this, if you put wheels um, into mouse cages, uh, mice are nocturnal, so they will run um, at night, and they typically run five to seven kilometers a night. So what's really humiliating is that's as much as I run, and they're faster than I am, so, <laughs> so that's a little bit upsetting, but they love to run, so this is completely voluntary, and everything I'll show you are, are things that are true in all of the exercise models that we've looked at. So, so to summarize a lot of postdoctoral effort and, and, and years of research that went into this, I think there were really three take-home messages that um, I, I at least thought were most interesting about this. Um, uh, the first thing is that when you look at these hearts, even when they physically look the same and when you look with an ultrasound, their function is the same, when you look at, at all the genes that are changed in the two states, so the exercise state and the pathologic state, they're almost completely different. There's nothing in common. And you know, one of the themes in my lab is that I'm usually wrong, and this is an instance where I was wrong. I thought we'd find some common growth pathways and then a few things that distinguished one from the other. Again, there's almost nothing in common between the two states, and the only genes that we find that are changed in both models change in opposite directions. So you know, that can't really answer the philosophical question about whether these are just quantitatively or qualitatively different, but it does push us more in the direction to say, at a really early stage, at least on a genetic or gene expression level, these really are different early on, even before the disease process has set in, and so maybe there is something fundamentally different about these two, two models. Um, the second thing that came out of these, which is really interesting and not something that we guessed, again, another instance of how I was wrong, um, was that the exercise pathways activated a series of genes that are associated with cell cycle progression or cell proliferation, regeneration, generating new cardiomyocytes, and I'll show you some more data about that. So this was just a hypothesis, but intriguing because certainly one of the limiting factors in cardiovascular disease is that in general, and when I went to medical school, I was taught that you could never have more cardiomyocytes than, than you had as a young adult. You could only lose them, and, and I'll show you some reason we have to believe that that's not the case. And then the last thing that came out of this that I think is interesting is in virtually every case, the pathways, the molecular mechanisms involved in exercise also protect against pathologic stress. Didn't have to be that way, but that does seem to be bearing uh, fruit, and so that suggests this might be a fruitful place to look for, for new pathways. Okay, so, so a little bit more about the regeneration um, piece. So this, probably the best evidence for regeneration of heart muscle in man came from this study that was published by the Karolinska Institute in Science some years back. And Jonas Friesen and, and colleagues, um, as horrible as this sounds, used the fact that those of us who were alive during nuclear testing were exposed to very low levels of radio-labeled carbon dioxide. And that got into our cells, 
And so they could actually go back, and this is now in an autopsy series of people who died of other causes, who, who didn't have any known heart disease, and they could date the birth of the heart muscle cells in that person's heart and compare that to the birth date of that person. And so what they found was that in a 20-year-old, there's about a 1% per year birth of new cardiomyocytes. So one in 100 cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells, is born in a young adult um, uh, uh, human. So, so again, this was a, you know, I, I think a, a major shift in our understanding because it, when I was in medical school, we were taught that the heart, like the brain, had no capacity in the adult to grow new cells. And this is saying it did have some capacity, but it's very low. So that's not enough to repair a heart after a heart attack. And one of the challenges is, you know, based on these data anyway, we have no idea what the regulators of that are. Is there a way to turn that dial up and make it so it's not just 1%, that it's a higher percent, and maybe use that in, a, in some way to repair the heart? So as I mentioned, when we looked at the hearts from mice and looked at all the genes that were expressed, there was there were more genes related to cell cycle progression and cell proliferation in the exercised hearts than in sedentary animals or in the pathologic hearts. And so we did a similar experiment. Don't worry, we didn't use nuclear testing. But what we did was to use um, a, a fancy kind of um, similar concept, which is a stable isotope. So it's not radio labeled, but it's a stable isotope of nitrogen. And so we could make quantitative measurements of birth of new cells in adult mice. Um, and so the take home message from these, which was really interesting, just published this year, is that um, exercise, so this is again mice given a wheel to run in. So they just run at, at, as much as they like, but they like to run a lot. So they are running a fair bit over a period of two months. So in those two months, they increase from that basal rate, which is also a, in mice about 1% a year, up by about five-fold, so 4.6-fold increase in the number of new heart muscle cells that are formed. So a pretty significant increase. And one of the things that I find interesting about this is work from other people, particularly Rusty Gage at, at the Salk Institute and others, has demonstrated that exercise also, and this is prior to our work and, and I think much further along, but demonstrated that exercise also drives the birth of new neurons, brain cells, in the anterior hippocampus, which is important in, in memory formation. Um, and so it has made us wonder whether there's some common feature to exercise that impacts both of these organs, and we'll come back a little bit to that, that's driving this kind of regenerative response in both the heart and, and the brain and possibly other tissues. Well, I think a reasonable question is, okay, so I told you it goes up about five-fold, 4.6-fold, but still the absolute numbers are pretty small. You know, how important is, in the, is that increase? So one of our collaborators on this, Rich Lee, who's at the Brigham, did some calculations, and the interesting thing is, if you take the basal rate, that's about 1%, um, and, and then increase that even to 3%, but it actually increases almost to about 5%. And the business people in the audience will understand this better than I do, but through the magic of compound interest, you wind up having many more young cells in the heart of the exercised animal, assuming you can annualize that rate. And so um, uh, unrelated to her work, this cartoon was online just saying, I'm young at heart, just slightly older in other places. Um, but it does suggest that cells can have different biological ages that don't necessarily coincide with their chronological age. So, so as I told you at the beginning, one of the strongest risk factors for cardiovascular disease and lots of other chronic diseases is aging. And we usually don't even mention that because we kind of take it for granted and take for granted we can't do anything about it. This has made me think, and I'm, I'm not trying to sell you a, a, an elixir of youth, but I do think that... Um, it's not quite so simple that cells have some capacity for regeneration and renewal. It differs by organs. The heart is particularly challenged. And things like exercise drive that. Um, and that probably would, over time, contribute to improved heart function. The other direct way in which this matters is I do think there's growing evidence that normal heart function is a balance between a loss of cells, especially as we age, and a birth of new cells. And so other people have shown that it doesn't take many cells to lose to develop things like heart failure. And so if we can drive that in the other direction by pushing the birth of new cells through exercise or pathways related to exercise, um, we may tip the balance in a favorable direction.
Um, and then the third thing that I mentioned was this idea of well, what are the molecular mechanisms and could those be useful in fighting disease? And so I'm not gonna go through this whole alphabet soup, but when we looked at um, what changed in the heart, it, it, it gave rise to identifying a host of new pathways that are important. And the interesting thing from our own work and other people's work is in virtually every case, if you mimic the change you see in exercise, it not only mimics some of the effects of exercise, but it protects against pathologic stress. And remember, the pathways are completely different. So, so the notion you know, that this would happen isn't necessarily given. It could well be that these would be completely independent phenomena. But in fact, even though many of these pathways are not altered in disease, when we tweak them genetically in a way that mimics what happens um, in exercise, at least for the pathways that are functionally important in, in the heart, what we in fact see um, is protection against those pathologic diseases. And I'll show you a little bit of how we conclude that and what, what the data look like. So then in some sense, the question becomes, well, which of these pathways could we manipulate in a practical sense in people with a medicine? Which of these are druggable pathways that we might be able to have an impact? Because a lot of these are intracellular pathways that are hard to manipulate. And I'm gonna tell you about one that we've gotten excited about. Um, uh, the names aren't so important, but these activin family uh, proteins, because they're extracellular proteins that circulate, and so you're probably aware that there have been a lot of successes targeting extracellular proteins with things like antibodies um, that can be made. So let me just say a word about this uh, family of of proteins. So the activin family are well-known uh, secreted proteins that negatively regulate skeletal muscle growth, meaning that if you block these or lose them uh, genetically, and there are naturally occurring mutations in virtually every mammalian species, including man, skeletal muscles grow enormously. So these are Belgian blue cattle, which have a, a mutation in one of these members' uh, pathway, the myostatin pathway, and they have enormous uh, skeletal muscle. Um, I'm told they're very desirable for, for, for eating, but, um, but uh, when, they, when they have two bad copies of that gene, they actually have to be delivered by cesarean section because they're so uh, muscle-bound. Um, and interestingly, the reason I think it fits with you know, our general model here is, again, in exercise, one of the ways your skeletal muscle grows in response to exercise, not the dominant or only way, but one of the things going on is that in broad strokes, although there are many family members here, they generally go down with exercise and so that they relieve that inhibition of growth and your skeletal muscles uh, grow. But they go up in different pathologies like heart failure where these things increase or after a heart attack. And so again, it fits that model that here's a pathway that is changed in opposite directions in the physiologic exercise model and in the disease models. We also thought it was interesting because there are multiple companies out there that are developing medicines to target these pathways, not for the heart, but for skeletal muscle. So for things like muscular dystrophy or in some cases even uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Companies have been interested in saying, gee, can we block this with antibodies? Again, because these are secreted um, proteins, so can we have antibodies that are either to the ligands um, or to the receptor or somehow um, uh, block this pathway? And there are clinical trials ongoing uh, now um, uh, for skeletal muscle diseases with some of these inhibitors. So, so in a sense, it's practical. If this matters for the heart, there are already drugs out there that we might be able to um, uh, exploit to help people with, with heart failure. Um, and we got interested in this pathway because, and again, in one of these profiling experiments where you can look at every gene that changes, these were the genes that were changing most dramatically. So we wondered, you know, what do these proteins have to do with the heart? What are they doing in the heart? Why are they being dynamically regulated in these models in the heart? Um, do they, in fact, regulate heart growth or function? Heart is really another kind of muscle that's similar to skeletal muscle. So maybe there's something in common there. And if so, you know, is it possible that we can use these um, you know, or target this pathway um, in, uh, in heart failure. So, you know, for, I know we, there are some students in, in the audience, and, and I would just say that, you know, whenever you think of an idea, um, the first thing to do is to um, admit with some humility that undoubtedly someone else has already thought of this idea, and go to the literature and try to see what else has um, been published in this area. And so, you know, in my day, we actually had to go to a thing, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called a library, you know, they had, they had 
books and we had to open them and read the journals. Um, but when this came up and we was talking with Mike Marset, who was a, a postdoc in the lab at the time, you know, we, you know, he said, yeah, let me see what I can find out about this. And so he went to the internet um, where, of course, he found uh, all sorts of authoritative websites like getbuff.com, because <laughs> again, these will make your skeletal muscle grow, or MuscleDog.com, D-A-W-G. Um, I'm from New York, so I understand that language. But, um, and even more impressive than these, these websites, by the way, these are, these are selling oral things that I'm sure are degraded in the stomach and don't do anything, so I'm not recommending any, any of these. But even more impressive than that, on, on the Muscle Dog website, they actually had in their frequently asked questions, will this inhibitor cause heart muscle or smooth muscle to grow? And, and actually, even more impressive than asking, having the insight to actually ask that question, because again, these are just different kinds of muscle, they had the answer, which was no, and they were talking about myostatin, one of these, but they said no, it's quite specific for skeletal muscle. So I told Mike, look, we have the answer. Why don't we just stop here? Because Muscle Dog <laughs> said no, you know, I've, you've done the research, let's, let's move on. But fortunately, Mike was a bit more persistent and really wanted to prove to himself whether that was the case. And so, so how do we get at those questions? How do we ask that? So in the old days, you know, again, when I was a student, you know, you'd go to a lab and you'd use pharmacology, but it's tough because you don't necessarily have all the right drugs and they may not be entirely specific. So these days, a lot of this is done in mouse models. Um, and so you can genetically engineer mice to either have more or less of a particular gene, to take out a gene particularly. You can make that happen in a very specific um, tissue uh, way. And then, you know, of course, there are some challenges in studying the cardiovascular system or the heart in particular in mice. The heart is about a thousand times smaller in a mouse than in a person. So, you know, if this is a, a, a nickel, um, you know, it's about the size of Jefferson's nose there. And so you want to study that. And, and then the other thing is it beats incredibly fast. So the resting heart rate of a mouse is about 650 uh, beats a minute. But I guess, you know, just in broad strokes, the important thing to know is that all of this uh, technology has been miniaturized to the point where we can actually study non-invasively and invasively cardiac physiology with a high degree of precision in mice. So this is actually a cardiac MRI that is of a mouse, and you can see the four chambers of the heart and the blood flowing through the aorta um, and, and so on. I, I have to confess that I occasionally trick my colleagues, clinical colleagues, by saying, what do you think's wrong with this patient? <laughs> and they're kind of going through the things, and I said, well, you know it's a mouse, I just want to point that out. And, and because, it, to be honest, it's a little hard to tell. So, so um, not to belabor, but Mike then, to prove to himself that these pathways weren't relevant to the heart, went on and generated mouse models and used existing mouse models to try to study what happens. And so just to give a little taste of that, this is an example of a mouse, the KO stands for knockout, where we've deleted one of these things, and then we've let them get very old. So these are about 27 months old, which for a mouse is about 90 years old. And you can see that the mice in which we've deleted this gene um, have much less fat than the mice um, that we haven't deleted. And then these are some measurements of heart function, just showing that heart function is better when we've re deleted this gene, and, and they have much less fibrosis. So in fact, we then began to think, well, gee, maybe muscle dog didn't know all the answers, and, and in fact, this might have something to do. And so then we went back. Um, my mom used to accuse me of um, going to medical school to cure disease in mice, and I assured her, no, we're not really only thinking about mice. So we went back to what we're really concerned about, people, and said, well, how do these pathways change in people with aging or heart failure? And again, this is from the Framingham Heart Study, which is a huge general population study that's been uh, uh, studied in it, just outside Boston for the last 60 or so years. and. Um, measured using a proteomic um, uh, platform the, the levels of some of these um, uh, factors, including this one, which really is just kind of an index of activation of this pathway. And you can see that over a broad span of age, from 40 to 90, there's a general increase in the activation of this pathway. And then we looked at patients who came into the hospital with aortic stenosis and had heart failure. And again, you can see um, uh, it, it, it uh, not shown here, it does go up as they age as well, but you, this is New York Heart Association class of heart failure, so more severe heart failure have higher levels of activation of this pathway, and this is something we measure 
chemically that's an index of heart failure. And again, as that goes up and they have more severe heart, heart failure, they have higher levels of this. And then among the elderly patients, those patients who have something that we call frailty, where their muscle mass is weaker and they, and, and, and they can't walk as fast, have higher levels as well. So, so these things, there's activation of this pathway in people as we age and as we develop these diseases like heart failure. Obviously, that's just correlation. It doesn't prove that this is causally related. So then to tease out whether this is really functionally important, those models, we went back to the mice. And um, so this is work that Jason Rowe, who's a very talented fellow in the lab, um, has done. And basically, um, what he did was to create models where he increased levels of some of these proteins. And just increasing levels of these proteins in either young or old mice is sufficient to cause cardiac dysfunction. So this is just showing uh, cardiac dysfunction and an increase in lung weight, which is a measure of congestion in, in the lungs. So these can cause heart failure. Then the question is, well, so if you could block them, would that protect or even you know, uh, treat heart failure? And so this is as close as a mouse cardiologist gets to a randomized control trial. We took mice and we, we did that surgical operation on their aorta, so we constrict the aorta. And then we followed them um, with echocardiograms or ultrasounds uh, for four weeks until they had developed significant uh, heart failure. And then at four weeks, we randomized them either to an inhibitor or to just the, uh, a, a placebo, a vehicle drug, and then followed them out to 12 weeks and said, what happens? And so this is kind of the post hoc breaking of the blind just to show that if you, this is a measure of heart function, when we do that aortic constriction, all the mice develop worse heart fun function, and then we randomize them in the white and the black um, to either the active agent, the inhibitor, or the um, uh, just a vehicle or placebo. And so the animals that get the placebo have no change. They have the same dysfunction. The animals that got the um, inhibitor actually went back to normal. We do a lot of these studies. We don't see too much that makes them go back to normal. So in fact, the fellow who did this, this was originally Pablo Quintero who did this, I, you know, I said, go back, do it again, different strain of mice, different inhibitor, um, uh, different doses, and he got the same result. And then we said, well, let's look at different models of heart failure. And so um, there, no mouse model fully recreates all of the uh, complex pathophysiology you see in people, but we've basically now looked at three different models of heart failure, that aortic constriction model, which is a little bit like aortic stenosis, and again, in every case, we rescue function either close or back to normal. We then looked at um, a genetic model, which another laboratory had come up with, which basically um, is a mutation that occurs in people that they've engineered into mice, where these mice develop profound heart failure. You can see how the walls of the heart are, are separated, right? And if they get the control um, inhibitor, they stay that way. But then when they get the active agent, the walls now are coming together, and the heart function improved by about 60%. And again, we've done this with two different inhibitors in multiple backgrounds. And then we finally looked at an aged mouse model, again, that mouse model where they're kind of on the equivalent of 85 or 90 years old in, in, in human years. And those mice don't have a weak heart muscle. They're more similar to humans where the pumping function is okay, but the heart doesn't relax. And you can see that their ability to improve their heart function when they're stressed, like with exercise, and their exercise capacity are significantly increased by this. So, so we're quite excited about this. I think the next steps in our minds are first testing it in a large animal model. So something like pigs are more typically the stepping stone to clinical trials in man. Um, and also looking at different populations of people, our hypothesis is that this isn't going to solve all of heart failure. I mean, that would be too much to hope for. But there are probably some people in whom the levels of these circulating pathways are very high, and those people would be most likely to benefit from inhibitors. Um, and so I, I show this picture. This is a man who had a pacemaker. Um, and there is a condition called cardiac cachexia, where people lose weight be because their heart disease is so bad. We don't really understand the basis for that, but one of the things this pathway does is to make you lose weight. And so, um, and you can see the pacemaker is sort of popping out there because of it. And, and so, you know, one of our hypotheses is that the level of activation in patients who look like that is probably much higher. And we think they would benefit, we think their hearts would benefit but they're also, because these inhibiting this pathway allows you to grow skeletal muscle, 
and not to lose weight, we think they would have systemic benefits um, as well and become more robust and less, less frail. So just to kind of wrap up and summarize, um, I think the most important take home messages uh, here, first and foremost, is that, you know, again, sometimes you hear, well, we've kind of figured out heart disease. And it is true, we've made enormous inroads. But heart disease overall, it remains an enormous challenge in medicine. Um, it's just that the nature of the disease we're seeing um, uh, has, has changed, and we're, we're seeing much more chronic disease um, and the diseases that we haven't yet developed effective therapies for, like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then the more specific messages were you know, that the heart grows in response to a range of stimuli from things like exercise or during pregnancy or even during postnatal development. Um, uh, but it also grows in response to pathologic stimuli after a heart attack or with high blood pressure. Um, and the outcomes of those two kinds of growth are dramatically different. And we think that really reflects this fundamental early difference in the pathways and molecular mechanisms that are activated. They diverge early, and so they wind up having very different consequences. Um, a real surprise to us was that exercise enhances this low-level regenerative capacity in the heart. And so, of course, we're very interested in understanding the pathways responsible for that and figuring out whether we can exploit uh, that. But more generally, the pathways that are functionally important uh, into the exercised heart also protect against these disease states. And so we think that uh, more globally examining those um, and finding targets would be useful. Um, so these can be platforms for discovery. And the one that we talked about uh, today were these active and family proteins that, again, we are excited about um, and trying to convince the companies that have these inhibitors in trials for clinical disease to try them in heart failure. So just in the remaining moments, just a, a few additional thoughts. I gotta say the most common thing I get asked is, you know, when can I take a pill so I don't have to exercise? This is actually, again, something sold on the internet that I don't recommend. It's called exercise in a pill. That's just an X. I think that may be telling us something. But, um, you know, and I think it's extremely unlikely that all of the systemic benefits of exercise um, you're, are going to be distilled into a pill of, of, of any sort. And so, um, you know, those of us who can exercise should, so we'll probably take the stairs to the gym rather than the escalator. Um, <clears throat> as, a, as a clinician, I think, you know, I, of course, we all feel like we don't have enough time for exercise, but, you know, this cartoon, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour or being dead 24 hours is a reasonable thought. Um, I think we also need to be sensitive to the amount of time we spend in uh, being sedentary. It turns out that that's probably an independent, related, but independent risk factor. So the sense that sitting is the new smoking, I apologize for the very scary cover here, but um, maybe it'll give you pause when you go back to your offices and desks um, before you sit in that chair. It, it, it may be out to get you. Um, I do think it's worth thinking about ways you can work in even low-level physical activity. I personally, my wife has gotten me a, a, a treadmill desk. She has a birthday present a few years back, which I love. She gave me a little note, honey, putting on a few pounds. Maybe this will come in handy. I wasn't sure how to take that. But um, uh, th some have gone to more extreme. Um, <laughs> Measures. I, I haven't. I haven't actually tried that. Um, this one also looks kind of scary. I do think there's a contraindication between uh, electricity and and swimming. So I again, not not recommending that. But but finding ways um, uh, to incorporate activity into your daily life is obviously important. Um, and so, you know, obviously our goal is not to make it so we don't have to exercise. Those of us who can exercise should, but many of our patients can't exercise or at least exercise to the point that they need to. So if we can identify some of these pathways and figure out how to target them therapeutically, I don't think they're going to replace exercise, but we may be able to learn how to mediate some of those benefits. And in particular, kind of the holy grail of heart muscle disease is figuring out how to regenerate heart muscle. And so this observation which, um, uh, that you know, exercise does substantially increase that, about four and a half to five fold, um, makes us wonder whether this also might be an interesting uh, platform for understanding that. Um, and then the second question I get asked is, why is exercise? Good. We've mostly talked about how exercise is good, right? Why is that? And of course, you know, we often don't really know why something is, but as I've thought about it, I think there are a couple of elements. One is, I think that there has been strong evolutionary pressure 
to select for a beneficial response to exercise. Dan Lieberman, other people have written about how our ancestors survived by being able to run long enough to hunt down uh, prey. We weren't the fastest, but actually endurance was, was one of our um, techniques for, for, for hunting down and, and getting prey. Um, in contrast, there's virtually no selective pressure around things like heart failure, which as I told you, generally comes um, late in life and doesn't affect reproductive success. And then my friends who are real physiologists point out that, you know, so cardiologists that I talk to often say, well, if you have a heart attack, isn't the rest of your heart just exercising more? So why does that lead to bad things and adverse remodeling and dilation and heart failure, whereas if you're exercising, you're saying it's good things. And, and so my friends who are true physiologists say, well, you know, there really are differences between the forces on those parts of the heart. They're not exactly comparable. Um, so that's probably true, but my own sense is it's not all about the pressure changes in hemodynamics, that there probably are circulating molecules. We've talked about some proteins, um, in fact. Some of the non-coding RNA molecules that we found also circulate that affect how the heart muscle cells respond to these biomechanical forces that they're exposed to. And again, we're particularly excited about understanding the signals that drive this regenerative response. And, and you know, again, as I briefly alluded to, Particularly intriguing is the idea that we see this in the heart. Other people have documented this in skeletal, in, in, in the brain. It may happen to some extent with satellite cells in, in skeletal muscle. Um, people have even written about the bone marrow. Is, are these all separate things? It seems unlikely. Is there some coordinating signal that tells all of these tissues to respond to exercise in this way? And so obviously we're quite uh, interested in searching for that, um, but don't have answers yet. So um, just to wrap up and, and just point out the obvious, which is this is, I get to stand up here and talk, but all these people are the ones who actually did the work. Lots of people in, in my laboratory, I think the work with the documenting uh, birth of new cardiomyocytes was really done by Carolyn Lurkenmuller, a German postdoc in the lab, and uh, in collaboration with Rich Lee's lab, um, and then uh, Jason Rowe has really spearheaded a lot of the active in work. So um, I thank you for your attention. I would be delighted to answer any questions if there are. That was absolutely fantastic. We have time for a couple of questions or comments. Carissa. Would you stand up so everybody could hear you better? Um, you showed that there's a basal level of regeneration and the mice are not doing this extra exercise. And yeah. it seems like that must have some physiologic role. Yeah. So have you looked to see if you, can you plot that or inhibit it and ask what happens to those yeah, mice when they don't have it? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so first, I think it's really fascinating. And the, as I mentioned briefly, the rate in mice is almost exactly the same as the rate in people that's been documented. And it's about this one, in a young, healthy, human or, or mouse, it's about 1% you know, a year. Um, and we've thought a lot about that. And well as even in the exercise enhanced state, we'd love to be able to subtract that out and say, so how important is that in the benefits of exercise? So both of those we'd love to do. So far, we don't have any specific intervention that we've been able to come up with that only blocks that regeneration. So we do have some pathways. So there's a microRNA, MIR-222, that's necessary. If you block that microRNA, you will not have exercise-induced birth of new cardiomyocytes, but it also does a bunch of other things. And so it is true the mice do worse if we block that pathway, but we can't prove that it's just because of the proliferation. So it's a great question. We're definitely interested in that, but so far we don't have an entirely specific molecular tweezer to go in and, and do that with, but it's, it's a great question. I think there was... Right yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm, Bert. Bert. Have you developed an exercise threshold that non-sportsmen Yeah, yeah. So the dose question is, is really interesting, and, and, and almost all of the data for that come from observational studies, right? And so m almost all of the data are saying, well, if we look at how much people actually exercise and the outcomes, how much do you have to exercise to actually have, have a good outcome? And so the current recommendations are you know, 150 minutes um, a, a week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of higher intensity. And then, as you point out, there, others have you know, advocated for intervals of higher intensity as a more efficient way. Most of those studies are based on fitness. It does seem that the more intensity you incorporate in and the larger volume, the more your fitness improves. But most of the observational data suggests that 
going, and when you look at people who are sedentary compared to modest levels of activity, that's the biggest bump in imp associated with improved cardiovascular outcomes. Beyond that, it's pretty flat. There's maybe a little bit of improvement. And then there's some question of whether there's a descending limb if you exercise too much. But again, I would say all of that is observational. Like, there's a, is there a reason though people selected to exercise that much? There's not really a great primary prevention long-term trial, but, but I think most people think you don't have to exercise that much to get sub probably substantial cardiovascular benefit. Fitness, you know, probably, you know, people who are elite athletes probably do have to do more to, to get the benefits in performance or fitness that they want. And then actually my colleague, Aaron Bagish, who runs a sports cardiology program back at MGH, has another curve that he shows where it rises quickly and then falls you know, almost as dramatically. And he asks people to guess what that is. And he says, that's marital happiness. So as you do more, <laughs> and then it goes down. So you have to be a little cautious there. But it's a great question. We don't have a perfect answer because it's none of that's been a randomized controlled trial comparing different regimens, which is really hard to do. Jane. Can you stand up, please, Jane? I realize that time many aspects where they're generating the carbon dioxide. Can you comment a little bit about finding data versus modeling data? Yeah, it's, it's a really important point. So, so I glossed over that, but um, heart muscle cells can have more than one nucleus. Um, and so one of the questions when you try to figure this out and you're kind of labeling the DNA that gets put into a new cell is, did that really make a, did a cell divide and make two daughter cells or did it just grow another nucleus? Which you know, is interesting, but is, is not the same thing. We're really interested, can we generate new, new cells? So what we did in that study was with the N15 thymidine, the two things are, first, it's a quantitative measure, so you can be confident you're not looking at things like DNA repair, where there's only a little bit of DNA synthesis. You can distinguish that. And then we basically reconstructed every positive cell, and we confined our analysis to the mononucleated cells, so cells with only one nucleus. And then we also did this fluorescence in situ hybridization to make sure they had a diploid genome. So it's, they didn't just make another copy and they're not walking around with 4, 4x DNA or something. So we tried to control for all those things. As it turns out, it didn't really change the outcome because most of the cells that take up the N15 thymidine to this quantitative set, extent are mononucleated smaller cardiomyocytes, which is consistent with what other people have suggested is the population in the heart that may have the capacity to, to generate, but absolutely, that I mean, one of the reasons we feel confident in this result is because we took all of that into account. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, it's a good question. I didn't I think, think I, I you think may be right. I, I'm not. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't know the direct comparison. I guess um, you know the the. The birth of new cardiomyocyte number is shockingly similar, but that doesn't prove any, you know, so I don't know. It's an interesting question. The last question up front, Steve. <clears throat> Where does the research stand with um, stem cell implants for regenerative prognosis? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was where, where is research in, in, in stem cell, um, uh, infusion of stem cells or injection of stem cells? So there are, there are still ongoing trials. Um, Got to say, it has been a field that has been fraught with some challenges. So, um, uh, gosh, you know, 20 years ago, there was a high-profile publication in Nature saying that if you took bone marrow in an animal model and injected it into the heart, you could grow new heart muscle cells from that bone marrow. There, and that gave rise to literally hundreds of clinical trials with bone marrow or bone marrow drive cells. Um, and I think subsequent to that, though, there were two nature papers done more carefully and with more sophisticated methods showing that when you took bone marrow and you put it in to the heart, you get bone marrow in the heart. You don't actually generate new <laughs> heart muscle cells. So then the trials have continued and, and a little bit reframed, and people said, well, maybe they release some factors that have benefits, even if they can't turn into cardiomyocytes. Um, so there are still some trials. They've wound down quite a bit. I would say also the person who um, was really the key champion of that work has, has had some questions raised about scientific misconduct. And so I think a lot of that has fallen into disrepute. And then there's a series of other studies where people have said, well, we really think if we're going to put stem cells in, they have to be stem cells that really can turn into contractile cells. And so there are a couple of groups that have gotten taken approaches like that, including, you know, you can take 
skin fibroblasts and reprogram them human in, in a dish and turn them into heart, beating heart muscle cells. And so there are people who have done that all the way in primates and are gearing up for clinical trials. So that is an interesting uh, thing. So far, a limitation for all this is that it's been hard to get a lot of cells to survive and last long term. Um, so I think it's still in its infancy. We haven't figured out the best cell type, the best patient, and so on. And then I think the field overall has moved from thinking that there are true stem cells in the heart. I, you know, there's not 100% consensus, but I think most of us think, and certainly what we see, is that that dividing cells are cardiomyocytes. They're not truly a stem cell. So there was this idea that there was a stem cell, some people even thought it was circulating, that turned into a cardiomyocyte. We think these are already committed in that lineage, and so that reframes the discussion a little bit. And so there are still ongoing efforts. You know, can we figure out the pathways, enhance that, or can we even genetically engineer fibroblasts to turn into cardiomyocytes? But all those things are still pretty early days. Most of the trials have been, clinical trials have been bone marrow. Most of them have been unimpressive. And then there are a couple of ongoing things just getting started looking at more cells that would be more contractile, cardiospheres and IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. <clears throat> For those of you who still have questions, I'm sorry we're kind of out of time, but feel free after to come down and ask the questions. Uh, please join me again in thanking uh, uh, our speaker for a fantastic seminar tonight. And, and please join me again in thanking Maurice Rouse uh, for his kind and generous support. Of the <clears throat> See you all November 15th, I hope. Great. That's, that's great.